Finance US is hiring a former California regulator as its new chief administrative officer in an effort to boost compliance and trust with both customers and regulators. The hire comes as Binance, the firm from which Binance.us licenses its branded technology, comes under heightened scrutiny and actions from a growing number of regulators around the world. Joining us now to discuss is Brian Brooks, CEO of Binance US and former acting comptroller of the currency. Welcome there, Brian. So uh, before we get into all of that, I, I just want to show this tweet that you retweeted from Binance US, working on a couple of new things this week, set notifications to on. Brian, do you have something to tell us? Well, Christine, you should set notifications to on. That's what I would tell you. <laughs> no, look, you know, the, I, we just don't want five minutes after this broadcast that you have a big announcement and, and we didn't get to a chance to talk about it. So, look, all right. No, look, I, uh, Christine, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk about this. I got to be a little bit careful what I say, but suffice to say, um, you know, Binance US is on a tear in a whole bunch of ways. Market share is looking very strong. Hiring is looking very strong. One of the things that you expect to see in a growing exchange is access to the widest possible scope of legal assets. And so without getting into any details, I would just say you should watch this space in the next 24 hours for good news and uh, coming news over the coming weeks uh, on our growth story. So there's, uh, there's, there's new stuff coming to the platform. All right, notifications on. You know, Binance US is hiring Manuel Alvarez, a former commissioner at the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Binance US was founded by Binance CEO Chengping Chao, uh, from what I understand. But Binance uh, US likes to keep itself very independent from Binance, which is facing regulatory scrutiny in numerous countries that are not permitting what is the world's largest crypto exchange to operate in their jurisdictions. and are causing certain banks to block customers from using their cards on their platform. Uh, is it fair to say that this hire is part of the reason why there is a need to stack, well, uh, there's a need to stack more former regulators at Binance US? Well, look, <clears throat> Christine, what I would say is the, the purpose of Binance US in the first place was to serve regulated parts of the world. So if you just go back four or five years to when Binance.com was first founded, most of the world didn't have a thesis for crypto regulation. Certainly the United States didn't have a coherent approach and most countries didn't really either. And so at, at that time, crypto exchanges were basically websites and you know, mobile phone apps that allowed people to buy and sell Bitcoin for fun and profit. In the ensuing five years, countries, including the US, parts of the G20, you know, and some parts of Asia, started to adopt a regulatory climate. And so it's increasingly important for companies that wanna serve those parts of the world to have regulators on staff who understand the way that licenses work, supervision works, the consumer protection works and everything else. And Botanance US was a company that was specifically built to manage regulation, all right? And so it would make sense that we'll hire me, we'll hire Manny, and over time we'll hire more people of that background because our purpose is to serve that part of the world starting with the US. Brian, welcome back. It's always great to have you on the show. So just to, going back to Christine's question, though, like all these regulatory actions that are happening all over the world, you know, Binance is facing scrutiny from, you know, Thailand, Canada, UK, just kind of like a domino effect. Is this coincidental? Like, why does this seem to all be happening in the span of a few weeks? Well, what I find a little bit more interesting, Emily, it's a great question, but, but I think it's interesting how much attention Binance gets versus other exchanges who have had those exact same issues. I mean, without naming names, you know, I can think of other companies that are very highly regarded that two and three years ago had these very same issues with foreign regulators and foreign banking partners and others. And so, you know, look, um, I can't speak for Binance.com because that's not my company, but having experienced that kind of thing myself, it's a natural part of the maturation process where you launch a company, which is basically a tech company. You then run into traditional financial services regulation, which itself is going through its own maturation process. And at some point you have to come to an accommodation where you hire the right people and build the right internal controls to be able to function in that kind of a market. Again, at Binance US, we have a little bit of an advantage because we were built for that purpose. I mean, we do have licenses to operate in 43 states and gaining on 50 at this point. A lot of other countries abroad don't have that experience yet, but they'll get there, I feel confident. I've seen it happen at other exchanges and uh, there's no reason to think it won't happen on the Binance platform. 
The U.S. is known as being one of the more challenging places for an exchange to do business. So if you could just like explain what are some of the specific risks that you face in the U.S.? Like what are some of the like regulatory actions that you're trying to avoid in the U.S. context specifically? <clears throat> well, you know, some of this is going to be familiar to any of your viewers, which is, you know, I would say that the SEC hasn't made a ton of progress in providing any kind of clarity for, uh, for uh, customers or for exchanges about which kinds of things are subject to securities registration requirements and which kinds of things aren't. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if they would spend some resources and tell us, you know, do they think Cardano is a security or Solana is a security or whatever? I tend to think those things aren't, but there probably are some tokens that are. And in the meantime, it's up to the industry to apply multi-factor tests and make the best educated guess. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. We don't, we don't ask truckers to guess what the speed limit is, and it's not clear why exchanges should have to guess what things are securities and what things aren't, but in the absence of any clarity, we, we come up with our best solutions. What I think is interesting, though, is a lot of the same people who, who claim to want to bring crypto under some kind of regulation, and I count myself among them, by the way, are the very people who have criticized other efforts to bring crypto activity inside of a regulated system. So I look, for example, at what we did at the OCC on my watch, where we attempted to create some clarity about how banks can interact with crypto. And the whole point of that was to make sure that an existing regulatory framework can be applied to the activity. But a lot of the same people who say that they want more regulation in crypto are opposed to the idea of crypto occurring in a regulated space. So I think we need to get over that schizophrenia and get a grip on the fact that this is a large and growing market, okay? People have made a judgment to the tune of $2 trillion of capital commitment that they want to participate. And so it's no longer a question of, is the market gonna be here? It's now a question of, is the purpose of regulation to impede the market or to facilitate and streamline the market? And I hope it's the latter. So quickly, just while you're talking about the SEC, Elizabeth Warren has basically said that the SEC should regulate cryptocurrency exchanges in the United States. Do you agree with that? Well, um, what, what I think, first of all, is there's a lot of complexity to that claim, because if, if the reason that Senator Warren and others are making that claim is because they believe there's manipulation in the market, and that's what they've said, we have a market manipula uh, manipulation regulator in the United States, and that's the CFTC. Right? So the CFTC has plenary jurisdiction over market manipulation in spot markets. Having said that, we've made a policy judgment in this country that spot markets generally shouldn't be subject to registration and disclosure regimes for a whole bunch of reasons. The main reason being that farmers who are delivering bushels of soybeans to market to sell for cash shouldn't be subject to some sort of constraint on their ability to do so. So the concern is that if you take spot Bitcoin markets and subject them to regulation, why do you think that kind of regulation is not going to come for the grain markets and the soybean markets and the orange juice markets where for 60 years we've had a consensus that that would be a really bad idea? So I envision that there's going to be some kind of a turf issue between the CFTC and the SEC if you subject exchanges that aren't dealing in securities to securities like regulation. Because again, there's a reason that we treat securities differently from commodities. Uh, it's an important reason. And if we're going to revisit that, we need to think about all of the implications. It will not stop at Bitcoin. Hey, so Brian, welcome back. I, I think, uh, you know, I'm looking to take a vacation about a month from now. So uh, you've been on so many times, I think you could be a replacement for the week. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we have, uh, along the lines about uh, security regulations, we, we had uh, Warren Davidson on a, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about stable coins. And he sees them potentially as securities, not just stable coins. That the reason being that if you have the assets backing those stable coins that aren't 100% cash in the bank or, or cash equivalent such as US treasuries, but instead corporate paper, commercial paper, that they're pretty much the equivalent of open-end funds with, with an, an, you know, an NAV right? and you have it priced at about a dollar. And he sees that as something that needs to be regulated as a security. So as someone who was a former regulator, what, what's your take on that? Is, is that something that potentially makes sense for, for certain types of stable coins, such as the tethers of the world and maybe even USDC? Yeah, well, well look, I, I think the, the devil is in the detail of what is behind the stable coin. So as, as you know, when I was at the OCC, both the OCC itself and then later the President's Working Group on Financial Markets put out guidance about what kinds of stable coins aren't securities. And if you remember, the SEC fast followed that guidance with its own statement that stable coins that meet certain conditions aren't securities. 
So what we were really focused on was true payments instruments, stable coins, stable coins like USDC, like BUSD, the Binance uh, token, and, and some others, where the tokens are 100% or greater backed by bank deposits and short-term US treasuries. And I don't think there's a lot of argument that that kind of stable coin isn't a security. That, that kind of asset really is just like a prepaid card. So if you think about the Bed Bath & Beyond card that you buy at the grocery store checkout counter, nobody thinks that that is a security. That's something that you add $25 to, and now it's worth $25. And the fact that there are dollars in a bank account backing the redemption doesn't mean that it's a security. The purpose of securities regulation is to protect people from mismanagement. And so I think the point that Congressman Davidson was making, Lawrence, and that you're making, is if you have a stable coin that really is more like an exchange traded fund or, or a money market fund. In other words, somebody's making a bunch of investment decisions about what's behind that and the redemption rights depend on how well the management team does that. Well, right, that feels a lot like a security. Then you need to know who are these managers and are they good guys or are they criminals and do they have a history of fraud or not and what are the assets? So I differentiate the stable coins that comply with the OCC guidance we put out, which are clearly not securities, with other kinds of things, which are, as you say, backed by corporate debt, backed by a series of long dated bonds or some other things, in which case maybe you're dealing with an ETF, I don't know. But I think in the end, the role of stable coins in the crypto ecosystem is to have a price stable unit that never requires you to leave blockchain. And that ultimately is gonna mean fiat backed stable coins that are price comparable to the dollar. Nonetheless, I mean, you, you allow, uh, on Binance US, you allow Tether on there, correct? Is that, mm -hmm. are you guys, now you're, are you getting them at a discount or are they at, uh, at par? In other words, when they come onto your exchange, is there any agreement that you have with Tether or with uh, even uh, US, uh, with USDC, with Circle, um, to get them not at par onto your exchange? Well, we, we, I mean, look, first of all, we run a matching engine. So we're not buying tokens, putting them on our exchange and then offering to others. We have a matching engine that allows buyers and sellers to come together. So we don't have any special uh, arrangement with either of those companies. And of course, USDC is, is not currently, you know, a significant asset that, uh, I mean, it's an available asset on Binance, but it's not an asset that, you know, we endorse over any other asset. Tether is the interesting case. And, and I have to confess, I'm not an expert into kind of Tether. You might think of it as Tether 3.0. But I think we're all aware of the problems Tether ran into a couple of years ago, um, and I think um, you know that's what led it to change banking relationships and change some of its backing. But I come back to the main point, which is you know at the end of the day, if I'm a securities regular, I'm looking at what aspect of the price is dependent on a management team, such that an investor needs to know who those management team members are and what their strategy is in order to value it. With Bitcoin, with USDC, with others, there, there's not a management team who's making investment decisions. In the case of USDC, it's dollars in the bank. In the case of Bitcoin, it's an algorithm operating on a network of computers. But if it's something different from that, sure, there's a legitimate question. Coming back to the Senator Warren point, though, most assets in crypto are decentralized algorithmic assets. There is no management team. And so my question again is, why do we think those things should be regulated like Ford Motor Company stock when they're really nothing like that? But do you think do you think you'll keep that on your exchange? Do you think you'll keep Tether on your exchange, or will you review it and potentially take it off? And do you also do you think that Circle going public adds an element of scrutiny both to your exchange and to Binance in general, Binance.com? Yeah, I, I don't think Circle going public does that. I, I think Circle going public is a great thing because I think the more crypto projects that are in the public domain in terms of ownership. Uh, the more it demonstrates those projects have been looked at by the SEC, they've now you know, had disclosures made to the public, and generally there's a mainstreaming going on. I think it's good in the same way that the Coinbase IPO was a good thing for the ecosystem. As far as assets on our platform, you know, like all of the other US-based exchanges, we have a really rigorous framework that we put all of the assets through, and we don't list things that our framework tells us are securities. There have been a, you know, I, you know, I can't say the exact number, but a double digit number of tokens we've looked at that have failed our framework. And so we've refused to list those. But suffice to say, anything on our platform is something that has passed, you know, a framework that outside lawyers have blessed. Mm -hmm. Brian, just uh, shifting topics again. So there are a lot of staff changes happening, hirings at uh, Binance US. And it makes me think of uh, a lot of changes in terms of uh, staff, Binance Chief Finance Officer Wei Zhu left the company uh, earlier this year. Was he ever involved at Binance US or on the board? 
No, uh, so Wei was a board member, no secret about that, a super smart guy who, you know, at an early stage of the company helped bootstrap it. I mean, remember, the, the history of this company is not nearly as mysterious or secret as, as people seem to think, and I'm happy to shed a spotlight on it. I mean, there was a time when Binance.com served all markets in the world, including the U.S. A couple of years ago, maybe maybe 30 months ago, a judgment was made that, hey, U.S. regulation has gotten to a point where you need a different structure. And at that point, you know, the founder of Binance said, Binance.com can't serve that market. We need a different company with local management. And at that time, Binance U.S. was created to be the locally managed U.S. licensed company. Um, no mystery about that. And in the early days, obviously, a lot of the technology had to be bootstrapped from, uh, from Binance.com. We had a couple of board members who were from Binance.com and a board member who wasn't. Um, now we're going through a maturation project uh, process, right? We're doing, a pub, we're doing a fundraise. We're putting U.S. investors on the cap table. We're adding uh, U.S. people to the board. All is part of a maturation process. There's no big secret about that. <clears throat> and as I say, is Way still of part of the board? He, he's not, no. As, as you point out, he's left the company. But he was on the board for a while. And is this connected to why former CEO Catherine Cooley was uh, also uh, transitioned out? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I wasn't here at the time that those decisions were made, so I can't really comment on that. All I can tell you is from the time I started, the commitment that I sought before joining the company was we're going to be a U.S. managed company with a U.S. majority board of directors and U.S. investors built to serve a regulated market. And, you know, that was the deal that I struck coming in. And thus far, it's been nothing but respected. I've had full reign to run this company in a way that works in this country. So I, quickly, uh, I guess from the, from the topics here, what do you, sorry, what, what do you think about what's happening in China? That China appears to be cracking down on cryptocurrency. Just putting, just taking off your Binance hat for a second. I mean, what, how serious yeah. this and how big a deal is it for the global cryptocurrency market? I think, I mean, I mean, look, obviously it's a big deal. I mean, I heard you all talking at the opener about why Bitcoin prices aren't moving, you know, given that inflation is being baked in. I, I would argue that the price of any asset incorporates all of the available information about the asset. So I would actually take the other side of what you were saying. I think Bitcoin clearly is an inflation hedge. And that's why the price is 32000 and not 8000 where it was when all of this money printing started. But the reason it's not 64000 is partly because of China, right? I mean, there is a global demand issue. And when China makes it very, very tough for the banking system to process payments in and out of crypto exchanges, when it's very hard for people to access crypto over the local internet because of the great firewall and things like that, obviously it changes the demand side in a significant way that's not positive. What I think the most important thing about the Chinese uh, moves are, though, is it illustrates an interesting choice for the U.S., which is there are some forces in the U.S. who seem to want to take a China-like approach to Bitcoin regulation, which is China has banned Bitcoin or at least made it very difficult to buy. Maybe we too should ban it or make it very difficult to buy through hyper-regulation and other kinds of things. My thesis is there's an authoritarian way of handling economic policy, and you see that in China, and there's a market approach to handling uh, uh, the economy, which is historically what you've seen in our country. That is where you allow people free choice, you allow innovators the reign to take risks and to succeed or fail based on the merits of their projects. And I would say that the Chinese model is not the model that historically made America successful. So, so to me, the most important thing is what policy lessons do we learn from China's attempt to crack down on crypto? So Brian, uh, in your capacity as CEO, are you looking to expand customer service to include humans that would actually answer the phone at Binance? You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of these articles uh, on the Wall Street Journal com primarily complaining about Binance.com, but these seem to be U.S. customers, for instance, who uh, had large leverage positions, or actually global customers who had large leverage positions, uh, lost everything, couldn't, couldn't get access to their, to their bank, uh, to, the, uh, to their accounts. Uh, we have people complaining elsewhere about Binance US. And, they, and the thing that seems to underlie it all is, is there's nobody for them to talk to. So are you looking to expand that kind of cust uh, expand customer service to include actual humans to pick up a f pick up a phone when called who can help account holders uh, get through their problems? Yeah. So so Lawrence, I am really really glad you you raised that issue. So so the part of me that wants to point out that in the most recent study of customer support, um, it was a different exchange in the U.S. that had by far the largest number of customer support problems, uh, and not us. But I'm not going to I'm not going to go there because I think the more important part is we have a huge customer support challenge at Binance US and I am very aware of it. So on your point about getting somebody to pick up the phone, my, my head of customer support is going to kill me when I reveal that we have now launched live chat. 
That is an innovation that we launched last week, and we're seeing enormous uptake on it. So that is something that you know you could argue we should have done six months ago, but it's now live and it is solving problems in a way that we could never have done when it was purely done through electronic tickets submitted through the portal. It's a great point. And I will also tell people that come October, we'll be fully functional with our customer's self-service application on the app, which will allow people to do things like reset their two-factor authentication when they've lost their device. It'll allow people to unlock their account when there's been you know, a suspected risk management incident or whatever. And so I think by the time we get to October, we will have not only had live chat for several months, which is now live, but we'll have a self-service feature that will solve the, solve the large majority of issues. And along the way, onboarding will become a lot easier as we expand our fiat rails. So we are very aware of these issues. I, mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to think that we are not paying attention or that we haven't decked hundreds of personnel resources to this. But I'm I think sure users day, will appreciate that, that Brian. No Just quickly, uh, we've got to wrap up. But the one final question I want to ask was about ProPublica. They, they've done some reporting that Binance US, which Binance launched with uh, ban management, received over $60,000 in PPP loans last year. Uh, why did Binance need these loans? I, I, look, I, I wasn't here at the time, so I can't speak to what the thinking was. I mean, I think you know at the time that like Ivy League universities, major corporations, I mean, all kinds of people in the middle of a crisis applied for PPP loans. Some of those people gave them back. Others of them, the program had, you know, very few constraints on all of that. So I, I don't know is the answer, but I also know that um, lots and lots of businesses, large and small, qualified and applied. You can make judgments about We'd what the right way to the program, but I don't. I'm sorry? We'd be paying it back? I, I, I spent no time back? on that call. So, so, so my understanding, actually, I'm just being told, is it was paid back. So thanks for asking. 